Thank you very much for joining us today for the civil society seminar dedicated to the ECB's role in tackling climate change. Civil society has always been a key player in raising awareness and mobilizing action to combat climate change. Many of our participants closely follow the policies and work of global and European actors in this field. Over the recent months, many of you have been reaching out uh, to the ECB to raise concerns about the uh, climate emergency. Your keen interest and expertise in this topic prompted us to organize this seminar today and present the ECB work on climate change. I'm joined today by Frank Elderson, member of the ECB's executive board, and Irene Hemskek, who is the head of the ECB's Climate Change Center. Uh, we will start uh, with the brief introduction by Frank, who is, of course, also a member of the ECB's uh, Governing Council and can shed some light on the considerations of climate change issue in this forum. And then Irene will uh, present the work of her and her colleagues uh, who are coordinating all the climate related work at the ECB. Their uh, work has indeed intensified six months uh, ago in the aftermath of the strategy review. We will then leave ample time for questions and comments from our participants, and we very much encourage you not only to ask, but also to share your views uh, with us as we want to be in the dialogue and listening mode uh, in this uh, event as well. Uh, a little bit of housekeeping before we start. If you have any technical problems uh, in the meantime, please chat with all panelists. And as stated in the invitation, this seminar is being recorded and a video will be published on the ECB's website afterwards. Um, without further ado, Frank, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Victor. And um, um, thank all of you for joining us here uh, today in this webinar. And I'm delighted to speak uh, uh, with you uh, and especially also to listen to you uh, on uh, what I consider, and I think all of us consider a fundamentally and fundamentally important issue. Um, now, I greatly value the work of organizations like yours uh, and the actions many of you are taking to make sure that the urgency of climate change is properly acknowledged and addressed. Constructive dialogue and exchanges of views are always beneficial when tackling complex issues that affect all of us. And I am sure that um, you are all aware, we are all aware, that the Earth is now already about one degree Celsius hotter than it was in the 1800s. And the past seven years have been the hottest on record. The, inter the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, estimates that global warming of two degrees Celsius compared to the pre-industrial area will likely be exceeded during the 21st century unless deep reductions in greenhouse gas emissions occur in the coming decades. Leave alone one and a half degrees Celsius. This has already led to more frequent and extreme weather events and natural disasters. And the cascade of dramatic weather events all over the globe during the past year has demonstrated in a most striking way that the consequences of the climate crisis are not just a long-term underlying threat, but they are materializing here and now and with ever greater frequency. The effects of climate change are therefore happening now and will worsen to catastrophic levels unless we act decisively to tackle them. These extreme weather events offer painful reminders that we must act urgently and jointly to address the climate and environmental crises that is upon us. In this regard, the good news is that urgent climate action has finally become a policy priority in many jurisdictions. And there are now signs that policy action to fight climate change is accelerating, especially in Europe. We are seeing a new political willingness among regulators and fiscal authorities to speed up the transition to a carbon neutral economy on the back of substantial techno technological advances 
in the private sector. Yet, in order to achieve this goal, our economy must urgently undergo profound structural changes. Ambitious action is still needed to make sure that our economy is Paris aligned and time is running out. Now, governments and parliaments have the primary responsibility to mitigate the effects of climate change because they, they have the most appropriate toolbox to do so. Monetary policy and banking supervision cannot be a substitute for ambitious and decisive fiscal and regulatory action. Nevertheless, although, as I just said, monetary policy and banking supervision cannot be a substitute, we all do have the duty to do our part and ask ourselves how we can contribute to fight against climate change and to act decisively now within our mandates. This is a task for all of us, including the ECB, again, within our mandate. We, as central bankers and supervisors, have a key role to play. And let me explain this in somewhat more detail. Firstly, according to the EU treaty, the ECB has the primary objective of keeping prices stable. And there is clear evidence now that climate change affects price stability in several ways. So the ECB must take it into account in order to fulfill its objective and comply with EU law. First, it affects the way that our economy functions, both directly through extreme weather events and environmental degradation, and indirectly through the policies put in place to address, to address climate change. We need to better understand these implications so that we can account, we can account for them in our economic analysis, in our risk assessment, in monetary policy and in banking supervision. Second, climate change comes with risks. A changing climate and, um, and related policies will affect some industries and regions more than others, leading to a change in the value and riskiness of the assets that we hold in our balance sheet. And this means that we need to adapt our risk management framework accordingly. Secondly, the EU treaty also mandates that the ECB shall, through its policies, support the general economic policies of the Union without prejudice to the objective of price stability. And since EU policies give high priority to addressing climate change, the ECB has a duty to reflect on how it can support these policies and then to actually do so, without prejudice, again, to its primary price stability objective. Thirdly, since 2014, and according um, to the SSM regulation, the ECB also has the mandate to supervise the European banking system in order to contribute to the overall safety and soundness of the banking system and financial stability. And it is our responsibility to make sure that banks are resilient, are resilient enough and well equipped to properly identify, manage and disclose risks, including those stemming from climate change. Hence, it is clear by incorporating climate change considerations in our work, we are acting in the pursuit of, not in spite of, our mandates. This is our duty, not an option. However, let me re-emphasize, the ECB is not a policymaker in the area of climate mitigation. This means that we are not in charge of making climate policies ourselves, but we pay close attention to the adoption <clears throat> and implementation of the respective legislation and build on the policies and initiatives that are being pursued by the EU. Climate change has clear macroeconomic and financial implications and has consequences for our primary objective of price stability, as I said. And as such, the ECB Governing Council is firmly committed 
to address these consequences within its mandate and published last July an action plan to include climate change considerations in its monetary policy strategy. But also for other areas of the ECB's competence, financial stability and banking supervision, climate change is of key relevance. In particular, the ECB has systematically and consistently um, been integrating climate and environmental considerations into our activities. Monetary policy, banking supervision, the management of non-monetary policy related balance sheet and the conduct of all our own operational tasks. And this includes incorporating climate change considerations into our monetary policy, financial risk assessment, expanding our analytical capacity to assess the effects and risks of climate change and implementing our climate action plan in line with the EU policies in environmental sustainability disclosure and reporting. On the banking supervision side, this also includes supervisory climate risk stress testing, reviewing bank strategies and governance and risk management frameworks, and conducting appropriate follow-up on banks' disclosure practices and their adherence to our supervisory expectations, including those on managing climate-related and environmental risks. We are also regularly and actively contributing to discussions in the EU and in global fora on managing climate risks, the financial impact of climate change policies and climate related standards for financial products. We are an active member of the Central Banks and Supervisors Network for Greening the Financial System, the NGFS, which has grown from eight to 105 members since its establishment four years ago. My colleague Irene Heemskerk, who leads the recently, um, not so recently actually now, uh, established ECB Climate Change Center, uh, will now say more on the actions of our climate agenda as well as on the mission and the functions of the center. So let me conclude by emphasizing that the ECB fully recognizes the urgency of tackling climate change and is firmly committed to tackling, tackling it within, within its mandate. Now, let me thank you once again for your participation and i'm very much looking I look forward to the conversation we are about to have with all of you today because let me end this introduction by very candidly saying the following despite all the efforts of the last years by the central banking and supervisory community we don't have all the answers and i therefore consider this dialogue not as some nice to have, but as a need to have. Your ideas and your suggestions, your questions, your criticism, your support are all key to further this progress. And such urgent further progress is all too necessary in face of the greatest challenge of our times. Thank you, Irene. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, we will now indeed turn to Irene Hemskek, the head of the ECB's Climate Change Center, to present the work of her team. Irene, if you're ready, the floor is yours. Yes, I am. I'm very uh, pleased to meet you today. Uh, actually, I've joined the ECB in last June, and it's been on my list to talk to you since then. And this is the, the weeks of New Year's resolutions. I think I'm fulfilling my first one now with you, and I'm just very pleased to to tell you a bit about the work of the ECB on climate change uh, and what the role of the center is. So I'm covering three topics with you today. First of all, well, our climate change activities, just getting a bit more in detail than what Frank already told, what our roles at the ECB climate change center, what we're doing with my colleagues, and also some challenges and other considerations at this front. So I've, I've looked at the list of participants and it's quite a diverse group. So for many, for some of you, this might be uh, nothing new and you can spell the mandate even if I wake you up at night. For others, it might be uh, good to really to, to just start and, and sketch a bit uh, the task we're doing, the different activities and objectives we have on climate change uh, in the in activities we do for the economy and also the financial sector at large. Because, of course, we have other, other mandates as well as banknotes, but I'm leaving that out for the moment, but really focusing, okay, how do we operate in the, really the economy at large and what are our objectives on um, climate change? So, first of all, it's economic analysis. 
So our objective there is really to ensure that climate change and mitigation policies are accounted for in our macroeconomic models, staff projections and risk assessments, and we will assess their impact on monetary policy transmissions. On the monetary policy side, we're really including climate change considerations in our monetary policy operations. That is our objectives in the areas of disclosure, risk assessment, collateral framework, and also our corporate asset purchases. We are there just looking really what can we do? But Frank said we're also very, very active on the banking supervision side. What we dare want to, our objective there is really to ensure that supervised institutions proactively incorporate climate related and environmental risk into their business strategies, their governance, risk management, uh, and in order to mitigate and also disclose these risks. For the financial stability side, it's really we, we're focusing on identifying, measuring and assessing risk posed to the financial system by climate change, also to inform the public debate, market participants and policymakers at this front. So this is, this is what we try to achieve. Let me now dive into a bit more detail what we on some highlights that have happened since uh, last June, as uh, once I joined. Uh, both Victor and Frank already mentioned the climate roadmap. Out of there was a monetary policy strategy review on July 8th. We published the climate roadmap, and it really entails nil, nine, entails nine actions that we're taking from 2021 up to 2024, with uh, clear milestones in between. So this is the, the the activities we're all taking in place, and jointly with uh, with Eurosystem uh, National Central Bank. On the financial stability side, in September, we published our economy-wide climate stress test. We included data for over a millions of companies and a lot of, uh, and, and also from banks. And for us, it was really important to see the results because it showed that the short-term costs of the green transition are compensated by its long-term benefits. In simple words, we better act now and take and move forward on a on a clear transition path and get our economy moving because time is running out and if we if we don't act the bill will only increase getting near the, nearing the future and we'll, and that leaves the bill with our children right um for banking supervision uh in 2022 already we published a uh, guide with supervisory expectations what do we expect from from banks to managing climate related and environmental risk. This really like we were transparent on okay, what are the expectations we are having towards you on towards you banks uh, to move forward on this theme. Uh, over the past uh, year on 2021, there was an uh, banks executed the self assessment. And this assessment showed that banks, although I have to say, like a lot of them are really moving up on this. But still, most banks do not meet these expectations. Uh, so there's there's a job to do on that front as well. The last uh, highlight, well, I'm, I'm just really pleased that the ECB launched this climate change center uh, because I will show you later the activities are taking place on climate change all around the ECB. And it's just so good to give this most very important topic a home to make it, and, and really, uh, I'm there to push forward the team as much as I can. So this is this is uh, looking back of the, on the past uh, half year, uh, looking forward. Um, what is coming up in 2022? Well, I've highlighted here some actions that are in the, in the climate roadmap coming out of the monetary policy strategy review. Uh, for this year, we have the macroeconomic projections. Uh, so we really in, we, we are introducing assumptions on carbon pricing and evaluating the impact on climate related fiscal policies. On the corporate sector asset purchases, we, de we are developing proposals to adapt the CSPP, the corporate sector asset purchase program framework to include climate change considerations. Um, this is what we're doing. Uh, we're developing it uh, the first half of 2022 and then moving forward, uh, the, the rest to really make the adaptations needed that comes out of that work. For the Eurosystem balance sheet, um, we're executing a pilot uh, climate stress test. Last year, we were already um, uh, collecting the data, developing the methodology, and now we're executing this year. For the collateral framework, where we're reviewing valuation and risk controls 
to ensure that climate change risks are reflected in our collateral framework and assessing financial innovation related to climate to environmental sustainability. For disclosure, we are designing the operational and legal preparations to in introduce disclosure requirements for private sector asset purchases, private sector assets in the collateral framework and asset purchases. Help to have it ready by the end of 2022. And the last point here, I think this is also very important to emphasize, statistical data. Every, every debate uh, I've participated in uh, for the past year since I've been working on this topic, everybody's talking about data. And I think data is a very, is a key element to really be able for us to make, to make us possible to measure risks and to really um, ground our analysis on this. So we're, what we're doing, developing on this front is um, uh, indicators on green financial instruments, portfolio exposures of financial institutions to physical uh, and fiscal risk and carbon footprint. So that's also the transition risk insight. And also, so that's, that's what we're doing on the data front. That's a long list already. Uh, that's only the climate roadmap activities. Uh, for the financial stability, uh, we're improving uh, and, and regular assessing our exposures of our, of our financial system to climate-related risk. With this, we're really building on the experience we've, we've gained on the on executing this economy-wide climate stress test uh, last year. On bank banking supervision, I think Frank already mentioned it. Uh, uh, and also what I what I said, what, what we just published in, in December, like what is what is the state of play currently with banks on uh, applying our supervisory expectations, where are they? Next year, we're building up on this. So we're completing um, uh, our supervisory climate stress test. I think this is a very key milestone uh, to do. Um, this, is, this is what we're planning the coming, uh, coming year to do. A thematic review of banks' climate strategies and governance and risk management frameworks. Uh, on-site inspections, that means that supervisors really go on-site, uh, COVID restrictions permitting, but see what banks are doing at this front. And then uh, follow up by joint, joint supervisory teams. This means that like uh, the ECB works with the national uh, supervisory authorities to with all the banks uh, that are operating in the different uh, countries of the EU to see on their disclosure practices uh, and their adherence to supervisory expectations laid down in the, in the um, ECB guide with the uh, supervisory expectations on climate related and environmental risk. And we also will feedback to banks and report on climate risk disclosures. I, I expect we dis publish something in the coming months on disclosures as well in this regard. So this is, um, this is a big to-do list for the coming year. Um, and I think this is a good bridge to go to uh, the ECB Climate Change Center to, to give you a bit insights on, on the work we're doing at that front. So our main functions is steer the ECB climate change strategy. So there was a climate roadmap and there are more activities taking place. So we're really aligning priorities, uh, objectives and processes across business areas. So everything what's happening within the ECB. How are we doing that? Well, first of all, we're really connecting people. We know, we, we have a very clear view who is working on what within the ECB and make sure that people talk to each other and share the information. We're really a facilitator at that front. And also a form to achieve better awareness of ECB climate change work within the ECB, but also beyond. So really trying to improve our transparency on this front. And also I think this, this dialogue with you today is a good example. Uh, although I ho really hope this is going to be a two-way two -way street because I'm always, always also curious to learn from you. Um, sec thirdly, coordinating. So we're really coordinating the climate change work um, and see this, identify anything that is uh, relevant. And we were, are supporting key stakeholders in implementing climate change strategy with the ECB and beyond. To give you a, a bit of insight on like under the hood of this, uh, this machine, how we work. Um, so I've, I've dropped the word business area a couple of times. Well, that means like units within the ECB that are working on specific topics. On the right of this slide, you see all the, the business areas. Uh, so we're closely related to them. And 
how it works that we have like six people seconded to the climate change center that are coming from this business area. So they're really a bit the, the liaison function that we know what's happening there and they know what's happening at the at the ECB wide. Uh, so we have a financial stability and prudential policy uh, work stream, financial market operation and risk, EU policy and financial regulation and I'll come to this later because I think this is a very important development as well uh, I think where Frank alluded to uh, that maybe we're not uh, well we are not the policy maker on climate mitigation but we do participate in a lot of debates on this front we have the macroeconomic analysis and the monetary policy and of course data and also our corporate sustainability because we have to practice what we preach and we want to practice what we preach and that is this is, I have a short slide on that as well to give you some insight on that because, of course, as a corporate, we're also looking into what can we do to, to improve uh, our action on climate and, and, re and reduce our environmental footprint. So there's one work stream on corporate sustainability. This is led by a green ECB team, so it's really an internal team to move forward on this. We're having uh, several focus areas there. They're mentioned on this slide, but to just to to mention the last that the, the few that are mentioned on the bottom there are like 30 if we what we already is achieved at this front is a 37 percent reduction of our carbon footprint between 2008 and 2019 well going 2050 of course you should be reduced to zero but this is the path we're really on and also alignment of ecb's emissions reductions with the paris agreement so this is really how how are we going to achieve net zero there so this is this is a bit the work what I'm doing. I'm I feel I, I'm there, really there to steer the ECB work and make everybody able to deliver upon our expectations and the expectations and push it as far as possible. The other slides I the last two slides I want to bring to your attention is uh, some challenges and considerations. Because it's it's important to also sketch like we're not working in a silo. What I've uh, shown you, like the work we're doing uh, within the Cl climate change center, it's it's a lot of it in internal focus. But we're living in a big ecosystem at this front. There are three challenges and considerations at this front that I want to share with you. First of all, the complexity of foreseen actions. Like all we are doing, we really want to ground our actions with thorough analysis. And this, this requires sometimes time, right? And major leaps in availability and quality of climate change related data and modeling techniques. This requires time. We try to push it back as much as possible, but we do need to have, uh, we, we need to really, uh, well, base ourselves on thorough analysis. Uh, the policy making process, well, that's the same, like the ECB here, our home in Frankfurt, we're working closely with a lot of uh, banks in the Euro system. So we really have to ensure also that our measures, what we're doing are legitimate. And um, we also work with all the NCBs at this front. So we, our actions are accounted for at many, with many stakeholders. The last challenge I want to mention here is the progress in EU regulation. So governments, and parliaments remain the primary actors in addressing climate change and with the widest tool and they have the wild, widest toolbox to address it so our success hinges on regulatory process for example on on defining clear transition path on taxonomy and data and disclosure requirements a lot of if we really want to have insights on the risk we need to have insight of not only the financial institutions, but also the companies they are invested in. So the whole ecosystem we're working in at this front. This is the, this is the last uh, slide I want to share with you that, that also shows the broader context we're operating in. Frank already uh, mentioned it, like we're, we're part of, uh, we're, we're participating in a lot of debates uh, within the EU. We're part of the EU Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance. Uh, we're, we're taking, of course, uh, we're part of the EBA's work on sustainable finance. We're following the AFRAC work very closely. 
we're a member of the Financial Stability Board, the OECD, the G7, the G20, the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, um, and the NGFS. So within the NGFS, we're a member of the steering committee, so we're really closely involved in that work. And I think this is also very much needed. And to speak also from a personal experience, uh, what the NGFS has brought, I think, all the members so far is you have to learn from each other. And the work that we are we are searching on, what can we do on banking supervision? What are what can we do on our monetary policy operation? But to share this together and to do this do this journey together with uh, with your peers, it's just uh, it's been very instrumental. Um, that's my ob ob uh, observation to accelerate the work that every central bank and supervisor is undertaking at this front around the world. And then I come to the conclusion, and because I'm just uh, very much looking forward to hearing from you. I see this as a starting point, as a starting point with a dialogue of, with you on this topic. And I really uh, foresee that we have this more often. And please share your thoughts uh, because we very much need your ideas as well to, to move forward on this theme. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Irene, and also thank you, Frank, again. I'm sure by now our participants uh, have uh, many comments and uh, questions that they would like to share with us. If you would like to speak, please raise your electronic hand. Um, you should see an instruction slide now. Once uh, we see your hand, uh, we will call your name and my colleagues will connect you to the panel. Please bear with us as it may take a moment or two. You will be automatically unmuted and we encourage you to turn on your camera and briefly introduce yourself. Please remember to lower your hand after asking your questions and in case you are experiencing any technical issues, please contact all panelists in the chat. Once again, if you'd like to speak, please raise your electronic hand. Uh, I see Stan Jordan uh, would like to take the floor. So Stan, please bear with us. Uh, we will connect you in a second. Uh, and uh, if you'd like to uh, start your video, please do so as well. Stan, the floor is yours. Yes, hello, and thank you very much for organizing this uh, this webinar. And thank you for your work more generally. Um, I would like to to react actually to to a, a recent speech by your colleague Isabel Schnabel, uh, because I think she made a very groundbreaking point on the implication of the current rise of energy prices that we have seen in recent months, and and what some are, are calling greenflation. Even though I don't really like the the word, because I think it's kind of misleading to say that uh, it's uh, the, it's climate's fault. So anyway, um, I think Isabel is right that there's a structural rise in energy prices and it, it, it's becoming a possible scenario that this will continue for the coming decade. Um, so if so, I certainly agree with her that the ECB will have to, to, to react to it to some degree. But how? Because if the ECB were to raise interest rate because inflation and energy prices are going up too much, uh, this would also have the effect of making green investment more, more, more costly. Uh, and we know that, for example, in uh, investment in uh, renewables energy in particular are more capital intensive and therefore the, the, raise of, the rise of interest rate will hurt them even more than, let's say, fossil fuel um, companies which investment have already been, uh, you know, uh, made of uh, years ago. So what I mean by that is that basically if the ECB just uses its traditional approach to monetary policy, and simply tighten policy in a, in a blunt way as the as the ECB usually does, then this will basically make the transition more costly than it already is. Um, so what do you think about that? And, and and can the ECB afford to do that? And would it not be a violation of your second mandate if if you were to both fight in in a way that also slows down the 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 the, the pass of the, the pace of the transition? And therefore, don't you have an obligation to look at third ways, at, at different approaches, such as the one that has been uh, proposed by many people to talk about a sort of dual interest rate uh, approach to manage, to manage a policy, and in particular, to the refinancing operation. Uh, and in that way, you could actually uh, both um, tighten policy in certain areas while supporting uh, an affordable cost for, for renewable energies or, or other type of investment that would improve price stability on, on energy prices such as mm -hmm. renovation. Uh, so I, I talked a lot already. Thank you for very much and I look forward to you to your thoughts on this. 
Thank you very much, uh, Stan. Again, guys, if you would like to, to uh, speak, raise any issues, please raise your electronic hands. Uh, I have a feeling that I would like to ask Frank here, and I don't know if that's <laughs> that's your that's feeling fine. as well, Frank. Well, well, well. Thank you, Stan, for for your for your question. Um, obviously, uh, very, very, very important and and complicated. Um, now, let me maybe say this at the start. Um, uh, many people see or, or or frame this as if there were to be a very big dilemma. As if you know, on the one hand, we have this 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 price stability mandate and on the other hand um but i i i i'd rather not look at it that way what i would say is uh, as i've said before we have to act within our mandate that is clear um what we now understand and that is i think clearly different from you know uh, from from five ten uh, ten years ago so it's certainly longer some some people of course you know they might have seen this earlier but 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 in mainstream central bank thinking what we have learned is that you cannot think about the functioning of the economy, that you cannot think about um, um, inflation, uh, price uh, stability, financial stability, a sound banking system, uh, without incorporating um, what we now know in terms of climate change, both on the physical uh, uh, risk and manifestations of climate change and environmental degradation on the one hand, but also on the transition risk on the other. So we know that we have to take this on board. Now, I think what my uh, and I, of course, I don't want to speak for my my colleagues, but but the way I understand her um, her speech is that it says um, that um, looking backwards, um, central banks um, um, traditionally um, have looked at energy prices as rather volatile. They go up, they go down, um, and of course, our monetary policy has a medium term uh, medium term focus. Um, so, to a certain extent, uh, what we do, of course, we follow this all very closely, but uh, we also, uh, looking at the medium term, we look through this, this, this very short term volatility. Now, it might be, it might very well be, um, that the, um, uh, the, the, the energy transition that we're going through uh, will indeed have uh, effects uh, that are more long lasting and less um, uh, volatile in the sense that they just go up and go down. They might, um, well, if that is the case, and if that were to lead uh, to, and, and I, there's a lot of conditions here, that's why I say if this were to lead, um, uh, not just to a, you know, a, 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 um, a one-off increase, but something that would, you know, be increasing uh, and then increase again and increase again, it would actually lead to, um, to, to, to inflation that is higher than, than our target, then we would have to act uh, under our mandate. Um, and that is what it actually means uh, if we say uh, that we have a price stability uh, primary objective. Um, now, maybe to maybe use this uh, this 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 moment to say, and because you know we might be focusing a lot on monetary policy, uh, but don't underestimate. And uh, even if people who now participate have not prepared for that, uh, I will just kind of like challenge you and come back to us. Uh, at a later stage, don't underestimate also the importance of banking supervision in changing the entire um, financial system uh, towards a Paris alignment. Um, uh, I don't know. I haven't seen. Maybe some of you have seen or you have thoughts about it. Would be interested. But uh, you know, you could actually see what you know what in the end will make the bigger difference. Um, uh, but don't underestimate what it means if we tell all the banks uh, under our supervision that they need to really uh, integrate uh, pairs alignment in all that do in uh, because the only way that they can do this is uh, engaging with their clients making sure that their clients do as well and their clients are the entire real economy aren't they so um so i don't want to walk away from the from from so everything you have to, to say about monetary policy please give it to us but don't forget to also challenge us on super, uh, supervision because we do a lot of things there uh, but maybe also there we can do more um, uh, and in the end uh, it might uh, be uh, very effective thank you very much frank thank you uh, stan again uh, again if you would like to speak please raise your electronic hand and uh, once we see your hand we will call your name and then uh, my colleagues uh, colleagues will connect you uh, the next electronic hand comes from maurizio vargas uh, maurizio if you hear us uh, 
please bear with us. We will connect you now um, and unmute you. You can also turn on your camera if you wish. Maurizio. Try to maybe uh, reconnect your audio again. Uh, but in the meantime, we would go to Adua Dalla Costa. Uh, Adua, if you're with us, please bear with us a second. We will try to uh, we'll try to put you through and uh, also encourage you to turn on your camera if you wish. Adua, the floor is yours. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Adua Dalla Costa from Positive Money Europe. Uh, I have two questions actually, and I hope I can take the floor later, maybe after everyone has spoken. But the first one would be uh, on data on, env on environmental risks. So we know that these kind of data are poses many challenges uh, to, to gather, and we really appreciate the work that ECB is doing towards that. But at the same time, we know that environmental risks are characterized by radical uncertainty, which makes them pretty much impossible to accurately predict and calculate. So based on this, I have two questions. And one would be, what strategies are available to the ECB to act on the data already available? And the second one would be, if you see a way to make sound decisions, despite the fact that data will be incomplete, uh, for instance, whether the ECB has considered at all applying the precautionary principle to overcome these limitations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Adwa. I know, Irena, if you would like to start. Oh, uh, we... I, I, didn't, I didn't hear the question you really didn't well. Hear it I have to, that yeah, much, yeah. Yeah. We, we didn't hear that well, but I think Frank was taking notes, so maybe then Frank starts. And <laughs> I, I think I understood that. you, uh, Alva. So thank, thanks for your question. If I if I uh, answer uh, some 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 different question, then, then interrupt <laughs> me and just tell me to, uh, to 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 stop, and, and I'll try to to do to do it well. So 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 if I understood you correctly, what you say, uh, which is very true, that um, um, of course, as a you know, they're, they're, we are looking at a very imperfect data set aren't we uh, as, as as mankind maybe even uh, in terms of environmental uh, risks so so you know if you we were magicians we would know it all perfectly but we don't so so what does that mean how, how do we deal with that are there ways to 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 address that well i think that you know what we have decided very clearly um and let me now focus on banking supervision uh, for 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 this part of the question um is that we are not going to wait until the world is perfect uh, because we cannot um, uh, the, the matter is too urgent. Um, risks don't go away because we don't have data. You could even argue that uh, because of the lack of data, the risks are even bigger because you know you might be surprised because you don't see it coming. Um, and you might uh, then use, I think, but this is just on, um, on the basis of what you just said, that the precautionary principle, uh, which of course is a legal concept which, which, is, which is there, actually um, um, actually on the lines why it is important that we don't just wait until the world is perfect. So what are we doing? We, uh, we use scenarios, so we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but in, uh, in our stress testing, uh, using, by the way, scenarios that have been developed under the ages of the NGFS, because we feel it's important that we have worldwide comparability, so we try to use um, scenarios that are also being used by other um, supervisors around the world so that we can compare. Um, and, um, uh, and, 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 and we asked the banks, one, to work with the data that they do have, and two, to then use proxies where they don't. Um, but we want them to grow there. So the way to, so, so we don't wait. So the, the micro stress, uh, the micro um, bottom up stress test that we are doing this year, um, um, uh, which visits all the, all the banks are on, under uh, direct uh, supervision. Uh, we require banks to run these scenarios. We put pressure on them to use the data that they have, um, and and this will, we hope, set in motion um, a um, a pressure by the banks on their clients to actually provide them uh, with the data that we don't have yet or that uh, are not there. So this is so we talk about this as a learning exercise. It is because we haven't done so so far. It's 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 a very big exercise. Many of the banks are actually complaining. Um, uh, which I understand, so I hear it, but I don't listen to it in the sense that, of course, uh, we have to be um, uh, we have to be fair and we have to be proportional. But we do say we cannot afford to wait until the work is uh, the world is perfect, as I said. So that I think is um, uh, is how how we deal with this, and maybe you can uh, you can extrapolate this wider. Um, you know, there is much more data out there now than there was five years ago. This is growing. The international databases that are there, the private actors that are there, NGOs. There are many, many places where the data can be found. 
um, that some banks actually do use and some others don't. And that is maybe also another aspect of what we can do in our supervision. What we do is that we say, okay, we give back to the banks what we see. We can look uh, in you know, the cuisine, in the kitchen of all these banks. Banks cannot look in each other's kitchen. We can. And we challenge them. We say, okay, you say you don't have the data, but some others do. Uh, and they get it from these sources. And then we try to, uh, to speed up the whole thing horizontally. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Uh, yeah, hope. Uh, yes, please, yes. Irina, of course, <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, uh, because talking about data, I think uh, it's also important that we're, we're looking also what kind of data can we uh, can we uh, collect ourselves, right, as the ECB. So we, we recently got involved with the TNFD, uh, so the Task Force, Task Force on Nature Financial uh, Disclosures. Uh, so there, we're also learning from there and how what are they doing at that front what's what are the developments there and yeah also looking broader on the data that we can acquire ourselves for our work and we have a big procurement uh, going on at the moment uh, hopefully that we, we will have a new data sets in the first quarter uh, that could feed our information ourselves thank you very much uh, Irene and Frank um, shall we try to connect uh, to Maurizio Vargas again? Uh, Adua, thanks again for uh, for taking the floor, um, and let's hope we can uh, we can now connect to uh, Maurizio Vargas, Greenpeace International. Maurizio, let's try again. It looks good, but somehow we still don't hear you. Maybe, maybe Maurizio, you can just put your questions in the. Uh, in, in the, the chat, chat or yeah, whatever, and we will read them out for everyone and then we will try to really sorry for that it, it looks from our side that um, your mic is on and we see you that's the most funny part but somehow we cannot hear you i'm really sorry for that maybe try to disconnect from the seminar and connect again uh we'll we'll uh, get back just, to you at uh, at one stage uh, we're really sorry for that maurizio but we're happy to have you with us and <laughs> please do uh, reach out to us uh, through the chat if we cannot connect otherwise. And uh, in the meantime, uh, I see a raised hand of Julia Simon. Uh, Julia, please bear with us. Uh, we will try to connect you. Um, if you'd like to uh, turn on your camera, please also do that. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours, Julia. Great. Um, I hope you can hear and see me well. Yes, we do. Um... Hi. Hello, um, good afternoon, and um, thanks a lot for the insightful presentations. And um, I'll also revert to the topic of supervision, I guess. Um, maybe just a, a brief comment, I would say. I represent Finance Watch, by the way. Um, sorry for not mentioning that. Um, so we are very much uh, with you on the aspects of uh, urgency of addressing the risk and also on the challenges that you've outlined with, with respect to the data and advancing on modeling and also um, with respect to the actions that are being undertaken to address the problem as um, Frank has just underlined the stress testing. However, I think um, our kind of concern is that a lot of that action is still building the understanding and exploration. And um, whereas on the other hand, we have this tension with the urgency of addressing the problem, right? Um, so at Finance Watch, we've been advocating for um, Pillar 1 capital requirements to address um, climate-related financial risks, specifically for the fossil fuel exposures, which are kind of the, in the focus of attention of the climate science. But I very well know that um, this is outside of the remit of the ECB, so I'll have um, kind of questions which are more related, of course, um, to what ECB is doing or can do, and namely kind of twofold. Uh, first, on the stress test. Um, uh, like looking into the upcoming um, bottom-up stress test, which ECB will be doing, um, should we expect um, or are you planning to also um, review the capital adequacy of the banks in the view of the risks which will be uncovered or explored? So is that something that we can expect this year or if not, then when? Um, in terms of like um, enacting an impactful action. And um, the other question, um, sorry if not um, exactly related, is, is on the macro prudential framework. Um, so as we know, there is a call from the European Commission like to the supervisors, including the ECB, to provide an opinion on the adequacy of the current macro prudential framework to capture the climate risk and financial stability aspects of the climate risk. So my question is, um, which analysis or which work is this to be planning or undertaking to answer to that call for evidence? And uh, if there are any views already um, on this with respect to if the macro prudential tools are fine or if we need any adjustments specifically for the climate risk. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. How would we want to divide that? Frank uh, starts. Yes, with the stress test. <laughs> Very okay. good. <laughs> okay, let me let me say a couple of things. This, thanks a lot for your questions, and um, and I understand uh, that you are also asking about uh, uh, pillar one and capital requirements more in in general. Um, it is true, of course, that um, bankers pay attention to all we do, uh, but they pay, uh, is my experience, specific attention uh, if one uh, starts talking about capital requirements. So it is. Only logical uh, that, um, that 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 uh, issue comes up. Um, let me um, let me maybe say this uh, a little bit with my uh, one of my other heads. I must be uh, transparent here. Uh, on as co-chair of the task force on climate-related risk, which reports into the Basel Committee, um, uh, the Basel Committee is looking at its um, uh, you know the the entirety of the Basel mm -hmm. Accord. Uh, this is uh, this is public knowledge. Uh, you know, looking at you know all three pillars, including uh, pillar one. Um, you know uh, that um, that um, you know uh, that always takes time, uh, but uh, serious work uh, is being done uh, also in these quarters. Um, as to uh, how we now have presented the the stress test, I think you're right. There is this tension, isn't there? Uh, and you know, if you read uh, the reports of the Club of Rome in the 1970s, you know, we are not a little bit too late. We are decades too late uh, in, in the work that we are doing. So every every uh, activity we take that takes a year or two, um, you know, uh, without, you know, really addressing the issue uh, as we might all like, seems like another one or two uh, years lost on the one hand. On the other hand, it is true that these things are really complicated. So, so, so there, there is there, 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 you know, even for those who want to run as fast as possible, um, it is just the case that that there there is a need to really learn how to do this. So, so the so we have never done this. The banks have never done this. We have never done it at a bottom up uh, climate stress test. Um, these uh, these these uh, the scenarios that we use are still novel. Uh, we want the banks to be forthcoming and open to us so that so that they and we can learn um and um, um and i mean there's all kinds of metaphors maybe i shouldn't be using those but 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 you know fully well if you if you teach children as well i mean if 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 if, if you create a, a little bit of a safe environment um um you know it's earlier to it's easier to 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 learn from your fault so we we present this and it is as a learning um, uh, exercise, but I always, in the same sentence, so with a comma, not a period, I always say, but we better learn fast. Um, that is the way I, I look at it. What we say is, therefore, that this exercise in and of itself is not geared towards um, uh, uh, having um, uh, quantitative um, um, uh, consequences. Um, this is a qualitative learning uh, exercise. What we do say is that we do not exclude that in an indirect way, um, uh, because of the scores, um, if governance or other scores that go into the threat process um, uh, are uh, are are uh, are being affected because of you know egregious process uh, the processes that we see or or a complete lack of progress, uh, then these scores might be affected and that might then have an indirect effect on. Uh, on capital. Um, you said, if not now, when? Um, it will come. Um, that is, I think, what I can say now. Um, the Basel Committee has already uh, said uh, publicly that um, actually climate-related and environmental uh, risks um, uh, are uh, a source of financial risk. We have said it also as an NGFS for many years, as you know. Um, and it fits into the um, the the existing risk categories in um, and, and uh, credit risk, in operational risk, in reputational risk, in legal risk, um, and we know how to deal with those. So if these risks are there, um, um, we can uh, we can also act on that. Um, and now, again, uh, as always, spoken maybe a little bit too much. So maybe Irene, if you take the second part of the, on the macro system. Yeah, uh, please, you do so. No, I think it was the opinion on the. On the macroprudential framework and on the on on how is it fitting the climate risks there? 
Uh, there I can say that we are working on it. Of course, I cannot uh, tell much about on our uh, preliminary conclusions or ideas about this, but here again, like uh, we're working on it. So if you have any ideas or brilliant thoughts that you can share with us, how we could take things into account, please do, because we, everything you write to us or uh, send to us, we reread it. So that's, uh, and, and, and we can see what we can do. So very welcome, mm. it's an invite to you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank and Ren, and thank you, you as well uh, for the question. Uh, I see we've uh, received a question from Mauricio Vargas, so let's maybe turn to that. In the Climate Action Plan, you stated that the ECB would like to conduct enhanced due diligence to incorporate climate change risks. And in the legal case in Belgium, you stated the ECB has already started to take relevant climate change risks into uh, account uh, in its due diligence procedures for its corporate sector asset purchases in its monetary policy portfolios. Can you elaborate what kind of concrete changes have happened so far? Um, Irene. Yeah, thank you, Victor. And, and thanks for being the voiceover for Mauricio. Uh, <laughs> happy here. to, uh, happy to. Yes. It's a pity we cannot hear him <laughs> yes, next uh, time. <laughs> yes, indeed. Uh, we, have, we have said that uh, we are uh, already uh, taking climate risk into account in our due diligence when, uh, with our corporate sector asset purchases. The only thing I can say here is that if we detect anything, like with any due diligence, if you if you see something, you act on it, like and 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 then you take the whole the whole asset into account, the whole. So that's uh, that's what I can say. I can I cannot say like what concrete actions we have taken, but please know that if we, of course, if this leads to something, we act upon it. So that's uh, my short answer. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, let's hope we can come back to our participants, uh, those raising their electronic hands. Once again, if you would like to speak, please raise your electronic hand and we'll be with you shortly. Uh, I see the hand from Roger Casale. Uh, Roger, if you bear with us for a second, we will connect you, um, encourage you also to turn on your camera and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, my, I'm Roger Casale, the president of Europe People's Forum. Uh, thank you, Frank, for saying that a structured dialogue with civil society and through civil society with citizens is not only a nice to have, I think you said it was a, a need to have. Um, I, I, as a citizen, I don't have a, the next brilliant idea on climate change to offer, but I do know uh, citizens who do, and I uh, do want to share my conviction with you that um, if we are patient and we speak f to enough citizens for long enough in uh, with a clear methodology uh, that it is a minefield for excellent new ideas for how we can combat climate change but of course that's probably conviction that we all share in this room but the key question and my question to you is how do we actually structure that dialogue how the european union's answer to that is called the conference on the future of europe and let's hope that the conference on the future of europe will become a permanent mechanism for citizens uh, citizens consultation but how does the ecb think that that dialogue with citizens can be structured what is the ecb doing to encourage other banks to um, engage in more deliberative uh, met methods of engaging with uh, citizens um, because um, you know that that's really in the end the thing we all think it's a it's, it's a great idea to do that but how do we do it in an effective way and with an effective methodology and just very briefly to ask Ir Irene thank you very much for her comments and she said about her news resolution I'm delighted that we our conversation with us is fulfilling her first uh, New Year's resolution. I wonder what a second New Year's resolution might be. And um, in particular, I think the thing about New Year's resolutions is that we, 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 we resolve to change our behaviour. And while it's true that governments and parliaments have their toolboxes and their policy toolboxes, the effectiveness and impact of those policies often depends on the extent to which we can change people's behavior, not just through their New Year's resolutions, um, but in other ways as well. And uh, I, I mean, we might reflect on what is happening at the moment in the, in the, in the face of the global pandemic. Uh, I hope that some people's New Year's resolutions will be to get, a vac get vaccinated and haven't done so already. But we do rely, don't we, on being able to change people's behavior, citizens' behavior. And uh, how do we do that? And, and, and how important is uh, dialogue and uh, involvement and engagement of citizens 
in uh, achieving that that end and and um what, what would be your reflections on that in, in in the context of climate change thank you very much thank you roger should we start with uh, resolutions or <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, let's then start with. Well, I, I, I can I can say something. Uh, what I think is really important is that um, all the news that we are receiving on wildfires, on um, uh, on floods, on drought, um, they're pretty scary. And it's not often that you think, oh, that's a future I want to live in. So if you're thinking about behaviors. I think it's really important that together we're going to build a story on a future, what, where we want to be in. And, and now we're focusing, okay, we can do a lot of things less, but we're not focusing on like, we're getting back clean air and a future for our children. I think there, uh, it's really important to start telling the story that way, instead of only focusing on, 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 on the scary part. Because it's it's a scary future, and I think even in these pandemic times, people need perspective, and also at this part. And hopefully, this will also be like a trigger to like what is what is really the future that is ahead of us. And there, um, I don't want to point to governments all the time, but to have a clear transition path to get a view. Okay, but this is the direction we're going. This is the the future we want all want to live in. I really hope this this will help to change behavior and come up with. Uh, also, some tangible things that that matter for you personally, uh, and what you can do personally. Because now you think, okay, but if if I don't do this, if I do this, what what is the what is the impact that it, that we are really having? Like we can all stop um, stop driving our car to work, uh, but that's not going to save the planet, right? We need bigger solutions for that. So to have a clear transition path, and also to 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 sketch a future that we want to live in, I think this is a very important trigger to um, to change behavior. Maybe, and then, yeah, I want to. Uh, well, maybe to maybe French. to add. Uh, thanks a lot, Roger. I think you you made some excellent points. Um, so maybe first on some things that maybe I I can answer, and others that I have to reflect about to to be really uh, uh, sincere. I think that in terms of how do we want to structure the debate. Um, you know, this whole strategy review, there were, uh, for the first time, I think, um, uh, what we call ECB listening events, where indeed, you know, the president, other board members, um, many governors of the uh, national central banks have, um, you know, uh, organized a little bit of roundtables like, like this one, uh, but with ordinary citizens, not maybe people re representing uh, also, by the way, but uh, not only uh, representing organizations. And, um, and that, I think, is something that that we have learned from that 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 is useful um, um, among other things because it forces us to speak in normal language uh, and try to 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 be able to explain these difficult economic concepts in in every day's people's lives which i think uh, is very important that we are able to do so and we learn uh, how to to do so so we have had these ecb listen events i think today's um, uh, um, outreach is something uh, uh, that is inspired by that, and, and 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 we will do so in the future. So this is not this is not the last time we we we, we do so. We try, of course, we have other structured dialogues. For example, uh, with the European Parliament, uh, both the president of the ECB, but also the the chair of the supervisory board, have their quarterly meetings with the European Parliament, uh, in which we are challenged, and uh, not 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 least on climate and environmental related issues. By the way, much more than some years ago. So this is very much part of the um, of the, the the dialogue that we have also with, you know, the European citizens representatives in the uh, in the European Parliament. And then, of course, we try as much as we can to use all the modern media uh, to also uh, reach younger generations who might not be so interested in uh, price stability, financial stability uh, as such, but are extremely interested in the in, in in the climate related issues that we are talking about today um so we do podcasts um we we, we are active on, on on various social media etc in order to try to also uh, uh bring a dialogue and by the way there of course a dialogue can be very direct because people immediately can answer uh, and and they do and they don't spare spare us that is one part of the answer the other part is say how do you um 
um, change people's behavior. And, and that is, of course, a difficult thing to do. So, so, so the first thing I, I learned from your question, when you said, do you challenge the banks how they try to change the behavior of their clients? I have been thinking in terms of how they change behavior of their corporate clients. Uh, for example, in terms of what we talked about uh, a little bit earlier uh, of data that they need to get from their corporate clients. I haven't been thinking so much about how they can change their citizens' clients, if you like. Good question. So I'll think about that. Um, um, trying to change banks' behavior. So that, of course, is the very essence of what supervision is. We try to get them to do something that they were not going to do by themselves, or we try to keep them from doing something that they want to do themselves, but we think it's not, 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 not sound. So, so, so whole supervision, the essence of it, is trying to, 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 to steer um, uh, banks' behavior. There, of course, we have a whole set, a whole toolbox of instruments um, going all the way till you know the capital charges uh, fit and proper testing um, you name it maybe the most in the end the most important thing is our conviction power really making clear that if you are a banker today you need to have a business model that is compatible with the 21st century and not with the 20th century and that means a business model that is parent aligned, pairs aligned. That means a business model that will reap the fruits of this great transition that we are making. Great in terms of big, but in the end also great in terms of um, uh, creating a sustainable world that we all want. Um, once bankers understand that, that that is what they want to do because it's better uh, for the world, but it is also better for their balance sheet. And there's actually no, um, um no 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 clash between these two uh, but they can be reconciled and they can be reconciled very well then our job becomes easier because then they are starting to run in the right direction um but um and there we have double leverage in the service that haven't we because you know we try to influence banks behaviors and they can only change their ways if they on in and on themselves change their clients behaviors and you made me think about um individual clients behaviors i'll, I'll think about it a little bit more so thank you Thank you very much, uh, Frank, and thank you very much, uh, Roger, again. I'm being mindful of the time because we promised to Frank that we will let him run a uh, quarter to five. Um, so maybe we won't manage to take all the free electronic hands that I see now, but we will start with Paul Schreiber uh, from uh, Positive Money, right? Oh, no, Reclaim Finance, sorry, Paul. Uh, but with us, we will uh, click you through. And uh, yeah, if you try to be brief, maybe we still have time for two of your colleagues to <laughs> take the floor. Paul. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello, everybody. Thanks a lot for this presentation. Uh, my question, and I will be brief, is about um, one of the items of the climate roadmap of the OCB, which is the decarbonization of the asset purchases of the OCB. So it's something that the Climate Center uh, will work on in 2022, but uh, today we have relatively little information about uh, the objective that GSCB has regarding its asset purchases, its corporate asset purchases, and the potential criteria that can be used. So I was wondering if you had any uh, precision about what could be the criteria and what would be the calendar the Climate Center would have to, to work on this specific issue. Thank you very much. Irene? Uh, thank you, Paul. Uh, excellent question. And, uh, and here I have to say it's the Climate Change Center we're there, but there are many, many experts around the bank working on this theme. So it's not really us who are doing the, the hard labor here. Um, what I can say there that that like we're exploring all options within our mandate at the moment, right? And we're really looking here again to everything we can do here. So it's it's easy to say, oh no, this is not possible. I always switch the, switch the question, but if this is not possible, what is possible? So that's uh, that's what we're doing. We're assessing uh, all the possibilities at the moment together with the Euro system central banks. What can we do at this front? Um, this is our plan. This is uh, what we're doing this year, and I think you understand that if you're in the process of thinking, it's not the right time to to tell right uh, to to be transparent about it because you need to have your proper thinking on things first uh, before we publish anything so when we have something uh we we will sure share what we can and 
and in the meantime here also if you have any ideas please share and i think you've done already on this front so thanks for that already paul because maybe if you'll allow me yeah, yeah. i'll be sure because i would like to uh, at least uh, those i see now on the screen uh, too um, um we everything that that your organizations and others uh, write publish send to us we look at that we make sure and and irene makes sure that the right people within our organization get that on their desks uh, and uh, and i from my position as a board uh, member i want uh, i want analysis on um, on any suggestions that are out there um uh, so so we received from some of your organizations uh, in the course of this week preparing for this um, this meeting already a draft paper um, and I've been sending that draft paper, uh, uh, saying, by the way, that it was still confidential and all that, of course, <laughs> uh, already to some people uh, within this organization, uh, because I saw some ideas uh, that I thought, um, uh, I'm not sure whether people are working on this, uh, or they might not have a good answer, or I cannot answer uh, why uh, we shouldn't just do this. Um, so so uh, be assured, uh, I cannot guarantee that everything that you come up with will be done, uh, but it will be looked at. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Thank you, Paul. Um, we'll go to Mark Beckman uh, from Positive Money. Mark, please bear with us. We will try to click you through, uh, encourage you to turn on your camera. And the floor is yours. Hello. Um, Hi, thanks Mark. a lot for organizing this event um, and for engaging with us. As you already said, I'm from Positive Money Europe. Um, and my question is about a paper that was prepared as part of the strategy review um, drafted by legal staff members of the ECB on the legal mandate. And it suggests that the secondary objective of the ECB provides legal ground for new monetary policy measures not yet envisaged under the primary objective of price stability. And I'm wondering first if you can confirm this. And second, if uh, the Climate Change Centre and the ECB in general is working on on such new proposals already thanks thank you very much uh, i'm sure frank would want to okay i'll say something on the legal thing and you'd say something on whether mm -hmm. the climate change center. um the the very short answer is uh i very much stand by that paper um so if you want a reconfirmation uh, yes um uh, what what the analysis in that paper has not been changed uh that is how we how we look at it um, um, uh, there's many things in that paper. Uh, it's a nuanced paper, um, uh, and 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 uh, and we stand by it. Iran. Yeah, what I can say on that is like we're 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 taking analysis at all fronts, right? What we can do within our monetary policy operations, and there we're closely looking at the mandate. Okay, how does it fit? And we're looking at all options there. So. That that is, uh, and and if it fits the first mandate, why do why would we need a second one, right? So that's also uh, a way of looking at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe, uh, Mark, because you know, I, being a lawyer by training, this is an interesting. The, for me, you know, one of the uh, the very interesting parts of this whole debate. Uh, and you might have seen uh, some of my speeches and uh, and then blah, 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 blog posts, etc. Um, don't underestimate how the thinking also what can be done um, under the primary objective uh, has been evolving uh, and is evolving. Um, so so maybe where you know some might have felt. Let me phrase it this way that in order to make some progress in this whole field, one would need the secondary objective. Um, um, it, it, it could very well be that, that some of the things that we are working on and that we are contemplating and that people are thinking about uh, could fit uh, pretty well under the primary objective. Um, so that is just you know a thought that uh, I also wanted to share. Thank you very much, uh, Frank and Irene, and thanks, Mark, again, for taking the floor. I'm afraid uh, we will have to close uh, the seminar here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Irene and Frank, for joining us today and for sharing your, your insights. And we would also like to thank our participants from the civil society for your contribution and very insightful comments and uh, questions. As always, we are uh, really interested in hearing uh, your feedback about today's seminar and any ideas you might have for the topics we can tackle in the future. 
Uh, you should see a link to a short uh, feedback survey in the chat, and that will also be sent via email to you later. But please look in the chat uh, and use that link. It shouldn't take more than uh, a few minutes uh, out of your busy schedule to complete and uh, the survey, and it would help us to tailor uh, future seminars for sure. Um, we look forward to, to our future dialogue, and in fact, uh, we would like to invite you already now to our next civil society seminar, which will take place on the 22nd February, and uh, will be dedicated to the work of our single supervisory mechanism and the condition of European banks. We will also tackle the, the issue of uh, supervisory priorities, and um, climate is uh, one of those uh, indeed. Um, we very much uh, look forward to seeing you again, but in the meantime, also please do reach out, especially if we didn't manage to take your question today. Um, please write to us on the civil society at ecb.europa.eu. Frank would like to say a word. Well, you just said it, but I just wanted to, to, to really reiterate that. I always feel awful uh, when you say that or somebody says that I need to go to it, but it's also unfair for me not to go to, uh, <laughs> to, 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 to other people who are waiting for me, but I also don't don't, I really don't want any thought to be lost here. So if uh, if some of those who have asked questions feel that we didn't address them all the all the way, let us know. If those who are still um, uh, uh, stuck with questions that you could not ask, let us know. Because you know the whole idea of this is that you feed us with your input. Uh, so the fact that uh, you know that that there's no more time now doesn't mean that your your thoughts are not welcome. So so please just just send it in. Yeah, please do that and. Um... Irene and her team and, and Frank, of course, will be updating you regularly on the progress of their work. But in the meantime, please always do come to us. Also, if you see any public consultations, be it our uh, acts or um, uh, European institutions, also reach out to us and give us your insight and uh, your input. Again, thank you very much uh, for that. That was all for today. Good night. <laughs>